third part of this uh, fifth topic of uh, contextual variables, we then uh, consider the DEA modeling of uh, contextual variables. And uh, just to remind, I already mentioned that uh, the traditional approach in DEA has been to treat the contextual variables similar to inputs uh, or perhaps to, to outputs. And uh, this was this Banker and Morris uh, non-discretionary inputs uh, approach. So these non-discretionary inputs refer to inputs that are beyond the control of the uh, management of the firm. So they are in some sense very similar to the, to the contextual variables. And I mentioned also that, uh, that uh, it's therefore then also a little bit uh, uh, questionable if these uh, traditional axioms are satisfied for the contextual variables. Well, this kind of approach of modeling, uh, modeling uh, contextual variables together with the inputs and outputs and, and not assuming any separability of the uh, inputs and contextual variables is also still uh, nowadays used, for example, in the, in the robust order alpha methods, or typically assume this kind of uh, structure that frontier depends on uh, X and Z and uh, there is not any kind of uh, separation of this uh, or, or asymmetric treatment of the X and Z, except that uh, that some of these axioms like like convexity can be relaxed for the for the Z variables. Uh, so in that sense, this kind of uh, possibility is is, uh, is still uh, still utilized. Uh, another point here is that um, typically this kind of modeling approach is used when we want to really uh, uh, correct uh, the efficiency scores for the uh, external operating environment. So we are more interested still in the uh, efficiency scores or inefficiency estimates, uh, not so much on the impact of the Z variables themselves. So that's uh, that's good to good to also keep in mind that then sometimes uh, we only model these Z variables, uh, we are not really interested in the impact of Z variables themselves, we are mainly want to correct for the efficiency scores, whereas in some other papers, uh, or in other studies, it might be the coefficients of the Z variables might be of the central interest themselves, especially when it's, for example, some management practices or some kind of uh, impacts that policymaker or the firm manager can actually influence. So similar to the Parametric literature, there has been, uh, particularly in the case that we are interested in the coefficients, uh, in many applications, this kind of two-stage uh, data and development analysis approach has been used. So, uh, simply to summarize the approach, in the first stage, you would use the data of inputs uh, X and outputs Y to estimate the uh, efficiency scores using the uh, standard DEA techniques. And then in the second stage, you would take the estimated efficiency score and, and regress that on the on the Z variables. So I already discussed the similar kind of two-stage estimation approach in the context of uh, stochastic frontier analysis, and I found out that uh, that uh, this kind of two-stage uh, estimation in the parametric techniques is subject to the omitted variable bias. And intuitively, a uh, similar kind of uh, omitted variable bias could be also uh, present in the two-stage DEA, although this, this kind of uh, endogeneity issues are slightly different in this kind of uh, DEA setting. I come back to that uh, slightly later today. So there was this very influential study by Leopold Seymour and Paul Wilson in a Journal of Econometrics in 2007, where they actually sharply criticized this two-stage DEA approach. And uh, first of all, they question what exactly is the model that this being estimated in this kind of uh, two-stage DEA, and uh, and what's the what's the motivation for this uh, second stage regression? So uh, they propose then uh, to address this issue. They they propose a probabilistic uh, data generating process uh, that in does include the Z variables, but uh, it's a deterministic model in the sense that uh, there's no random noise term present. So there's only inefficiency that uh, depends on the Z variables. So uh, using that kind of formal, uh, formal model, then they show that in the second stage regression, using the variant of the Tobit model, namely truncated regression, uh, is a consistent estimator of the parameters in the 
model, so this coefficient delta. And uh, I note here that uh, that uh, truncated rather than censored because in many uh, many uh, applied research papers, uh, the two-stage DA had been applied with censored regression because uh, in DEA, of course, there are several observations that are 100% efficient. So it might be kind of tempting to think that they, there is censoring present, but actually uh, in, in the data generating process of CMAR and Wilson, it's actually truncated from, from one. So that means that it, no, no uh, unit can be more efficient than 100%. Perhaps the main point of CMAR and Wilson actually is that, uh, that uh, conventional statistical inferences in the second state regression fail. Uh, especially they point to the uh, serial correlation of the, of the efficiency scores in DEA. That relates to the fact that, uh, that uh, efficiency is estimated relative to the other units in the sample. So, so by construction there is a serial correlation, like similar to autocorrelation. And to solve this statistical uh, inferences problem, then they propose to apply bootstrap. So another quite famous uh, contribution in the two-stage DEA discussion is the paper by Banker and Natarajan in uh, operations research around the same time as, uh, as uh, Seymour and Wilson were publishing their work. So they consider a slightly different model, and I have written it down here more explicitly because it is uh, uh, similar to this uh, semi-non-parametric model that I wrote down in an, my earlier lesson. Uh, notice, however, that here this uh, output is in logs and also the production function is expressed in logs. But uh, uh, the contextual variables uh, are there. In, in, they are not part of the production function or particularly in the inefficiency term either. And uh, uh, one notable feature in this uh, Banker and Natarajan model is that uh, they do include a noise term V, but the noise term has some upper bound uh, uh, V superscript M and uh, lower bound minus V superscript uh, M. So the noise term is, is, uh, has certain kind of minimum and maximum bound and it's symmetric. And uh, notice that if this uh, capital V M, uh, if it goes to zero, then, then that, that means that there is no noise term present at all, so then it would return back to this kind of uh, deterministic uh, DEA setting, essentially. But there could be some, some kind of uh, uh, truncated noise present. Uh, so then they, then they consider estimating the efficiency score using data of X and Y in the first stage. And uh, importantly, Banker and Natarajan show that uh, uh, standard uh, OLS regression of efficiency scores on Z variables is statistically consistent in this kind of uh, setting. And finally, they also, also run a series of uh, Monte Carlo simulations uh, where they know what is actually the true data generating process and they, and they assess that how well the second stage OLS regression works uh, in, in the, in to, to estimate this coefficient uh, delta. So, this is kind of a very different perspective to the Seymour and Wilson in the sense that, uh, that uh, they are kind of arguing in favor at uh, two-stage DEA is, is, uh, works reasonably well, whereas uh, Seymour and Wilson uh, argue that it's, uh, it's, it's really poor and, uh, and uh, almost, almost hopeless. And subsequently, there has been a lot of debate also between this uh, Seymour and Wilson and Banker and Natarajan, and there has been follow-up papers by both, uh, uh, both groups of uh, authors. And partly this kind of debate has been also, uh, also in my impression, a little bit uh, confusing because uh, uh, both groups of authors have a different model in mind uh, and they are slightly doing uh, different things also. So Simar and Wilson very much emphasized the statistical inferences, which were actually not considered at all in, in Banker and Natarajan. And, uh, Banker and Natarajan do include a noise term in their, in their true model, which was assumed away by Seymour and Wilson. So um, uh, partly this kind of, kind of critical uh, debate has been also a little bit uh, um, misleading, perhaps. So to shed further light, uh, 
uh, in this uh, study with uh, my co-author and Andrew Johnson, we also followed this uh, banker and Russian approach, but we we managed to relax some of the their assumptions. For example, we do not need to necessarily uh, know the sign of this delta parameters. We do not need to know if this. Uh, Z variables have a positive effect on output or negative effect on output, unlike uh, Banker and Natarajan assumed. And we also managed to relax some of the other, other assumptions. Perhaps the main result of that paper is to show that the bias of the second stage regression depends essentially on the finite sample bias of the DEA estimator in the first stage. And in the deterministic case, we know that the uh, DEA estimator is, is biased. And particularly, of course, uh, if the bias correlates with the Z variables, then we have a similar to this uh, omitted variable bias of the two-stage DEA. So in my mind, this is quite important to understand that uh, uh, even though DEA doesn't have this kind of uh, omitted variable bias like usual regression, in any case, if there is a correlation between these uh, Z variables that are not taken into account in this first-stage DEA, that can cause finite sample bias in the first stage DEA and therefore also carry over to the second stage regression. And to demonstrate, we also uh, replicate these Monte Carlo simulations by Banker and Natarajan, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. So our, our remedy to all this problem is actually to uh, not do it in a two stages, but go to one stage estimation, similar to this SFA literature, where, where the one stage estimation is the usual standard practice in the maximum likelihood estimation of the stochastic frontier model with the with the z variables so we want to do the same thing also in the in the dea and to this to this end uh, we can utilize this uh, fact that um, dea is just a restricted special case of convex regression so we formulate this uh, what we call one stage dea problem in this way that we we minimize the sum of squared of uh, deviations epsilon and uh, the first constraint is similar to the, to the regression equation that Banker and Natarajan consider, including these uh, Z variables. And then we have a system of constraints similar to the convex regression. And also in this one stage DEA problem, we also put this upper bound, this uh, capital V superscript M. So that was this maximum bound for the, for the noise term. So we can we can impose that and and uh, notice also that this uh, this uh, formulation uh, boils down to the variable returns to scale DEA in the special case that we we restrict this noise to be uh, less than or equal to zero. So if we put this uh, parameter V M equal to zero and if we assume away these delta parameters, so this formulation allows us to then solve this kind of um, second stage regression and the first stage DEA formulation as a one, uh, one unified uh, quadratic programming problem. So in my mind, this is a, a quite neat result. So how does it then, this uh, our one stage DEA formulation perform compared to the two stage DEA? So as I mentioned, we, in this paper, we replicated the simulations by Banker and Natarajan. So we have done exactly the same kind of uh, data generating process. Uh, uh, so for example, we assume that this uh, delta coefficient uh, uh, underlying this data is minus 0 0.2, and we have their inefficiency term and noise term, and we had uh, 100 uh, observations. Uh, and in this table, we, we consider the root mean squared deviation, abbreviated as RMSD, so root mean square deviation of these alternative methods. And um, you can see that there is uh, three columns uh, and uh, there is the three different values of uh, parameter rho. So this rho is a correlation coefficient between uh, x and z variable. So in this case, we have a single input x and single z variable and the correlation of the x and z is, is uh, equal to rho. And because this is a simulation, so we can control for this, uh, this correlation. And perhaps we can start from the middle column where rho is equal to zero. So this is the 
in some sense, the ideal case where this X and Z are not correlated, so it's easiest to identify the relative contributions of inputs versus contextual variables when they are not correlated at all. So in that case, we could simply, act, we could simply regress the Z variable uh, on the output Y and simply ignore the input completely. And this is what this first line OLS is doing. So we just ignore the input because if input and, uh, and Z variable are not correlated, we could uh, e even just regress Y on Z and we would have a consistent estimator. In that case, the impact of the input would just go to the composite error term. We would have a, but we do not have omitted variable bias because, uh, because by assumption Z and X are not correlated. So this is the OLS estimator. And uh, notice, of course, that when, when rho is equal to plus 0 0.8 or minus 0 0.8, so then OLS is subject to the omitted variable bias, and, uh, and clearly then, then this uh, uh, estimator for this coefficient delta that we are interested in will be, will be biased. So I want to say also that this RMSD statistic root mean squared deviation uh, should be read so that smaller this RMSD, the better. So the smaller values indicate better performance. So it indicates how far on average these estimated values deviate from the, from the true coefficient delta. So then if we proceed from this OLS, so, so OLS was consistent in the case that rho is equal to zero, the middle column, but it suffers from the omitted variable bias in the left and right column. And you can see that there is like a huge, uh, huge increase in the root mean squared deviation for the OLS when, when there's positive or negative correlation between in, input X and uh, Z variable. So what about two-stage DEA? So then we, we take this kind of contribution of input variable into account by this first-stage uh, DEA model Notice that the uh, uh, root mean squared deviation uh, decreases at least by by a factor of uh, of uh, uh, zero point one. So 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 typically this OLS has ten times higher uh, root mean squared deviation than two stage DEA. So clearly controlling for the input even by by just DEA uh, helps a lot. Um, then we have. Uh, three alternative specification of the one stage DEA that, uh, that we proposed in this paper. So we consider this uh, so-called deterministic setting where this uh, uh, capital VM is equal to zero. So we assume away noise completely. Uh, then we have a certain uh, bound for this. So 1.04 is, is the bound for this uh, VM in the second case. And third case, we allow this uh, uh, parameter VM go to infinity. In fact, that means that we just relax this uh, uh, constraint completely. So if you first look at this uh, performance of one stage DEA in the case that uh, there's no correlation between uh, Z variable and input, so middle column, uh, notice that, uh, that the performance of one stage DEA is, is very similar to two stage DEA. There's not really huge difference and in fact, in the specifications of one stage DEA, uh, the best performance in that case is obtained by putting some kind of bound for this uh, V of um, M, so this, this middle case, but uh, eliminating that kind of arbitrary bound is also, also quite fine. Perhaps the biggest gain of using the one stage DEA comes when actually uh, this uh, contextual variable is correlated with the input variable. So notice that in these most extreme cases that when rho is equal to minus 0 0.8 or plus 0 0.8, then there is a clear benefit of, uh, of uh, doing one stage DEA compared to the two stage DEA. So the root main squared error is, is considerably lower. And, and also you can notice that, uh, that uh, the case where they, we do not impose any bound for this, uh, this uh, impact of noise, uh, that, that performs best. So that suggests me that, uh, that there is not really much benefit of uh, imposing some kind of arbitrary bounds for this, uh, this uh, noise term. In some, some cases, it might, uh, might help a little bit, but uh, 
it's perhaps not really worth doing it. And particularly, there is a, there is a benefit of one-stage modeling when the input variable is correlated with the, with the contextual variable Z. And uh, so, so if you can, can first of all, in practice, you can check that if the, if the inputs are correlated with the Z variable, and if, if not, then, then uh, perhaps two-stage DEA can, can work reasonably well when using with the OLS regression in the second stage. But if there is correlation, then, then clearly one stage DEA is, uh, is a preferred approach. And um, so there, there is also a lot of, lot of uh, other simulations. I just go through this one, one baseline scenario here, but we have also considered that uh, uh, what if this coefficient delta is, uh, is bigger, or if there is more noise, or if there's no noise and, uh, and different sample sizes, so you can see more more further simulations in that that paper that's also included in the reading package of the of this theme five so as the fourth uh, session then I, I consider further this semi-non parametric approach but uh, but uh, we step away from the dea setting and operate more in this uh, convex regression and and stoned setting 